Hey class, welcome back. If you check out the board behind me, we've got our notes for the 15th and the 16th, ending up week eight, and actually this will carry us on into week nine. And we're starting to talk about specifically the six kingdoms of life, but we'll jump into that right after the current events. The current events today started us off with a really good story on CNN 10. One was about cloud seeding. Cloud seeding is when they put silver iodide in clouds and they try and make a little spot for snow, for water to condense to make snow and rain. If you look at that, there's a lot of issues there in terms of one, does it even work? Uh, two, what about the snow that you make? Does it take snow away from people downwind where the storm would end up going? There's a lot of interesting things there, especially in California where we deal, deal with extremes. And of course, the, cl the climate is getting more extreme lately, but where we deal with you know either severe droughts or sometimes too much rain, Really good story there. And then this one is awesome, I love it. The New Horizons spacecraft, the fastest spacecraft that we've ever sent out there. We got a, a gravity assist from the sun, it zipped out to, to Pluto. Uh, as you probably know, P Pluto got uh, demoted, if you will, to dwarf planet status a couple of years ago. Um, when you get out to Pluto, you're, you're talking about an icy body out there, just a little bit bigger than our own moon. However, turns out to be stunningly amazing in terms of what they found out there. There's canyons deeper than the Grand Canyon. There are mountains taller than Mount Everest. There are absolutely stunning uh, snows that are from frozen methane. So it's really turned out to be an absolutely exciting world out there. So do check out those two stories when you get a chance. Our next jump was, of course, to talk about exactly what the book is talking about, the six kingdoms of life. Now, check this out. I put this in there uh, at the end of the first period, I believe. 1977 was when they took bacteria and they split it basically into two into two different kingdoms. They have you know regular, if you will, bacteria, the bacteria that we used to all lump together, and then archaea bacteria. We'll talk about archaea bacteria in a second. But you bacteria, when I started talking about this, the example that we gave was talking a little bit about camping. Now, for example, I love, love, love going backpacking in the Sierra with my brother when I get a chance. Didn't get to go this year, but when you get up into the high Sierra, you never know if the water is totally safe, like it usually is, if it's running water. But sometimes, to be extra sure, you want to boil it because it kills any parasites. We don't ever talk too much about it yet, but it kills parasites and bacteria that might be hanging out in the water from, say, livestock that came through or something like that. You boil the water for a few minutes, uh, you let it cool, of course, and then you've got good drinking water. Uh, you bacteria doesn't survive boiling. It does have a reputation for causing sickness, but that's because you probably think about bacterial infections like ear infections, strep throat, stuff like that, as being the types of things that you take penicillin for. However, um, it turns out you bacteria is, is it's ubiquitous. It's all over the place. Uh, we couldn't digest our food without a stomach full of you bacteria that lives there. It helps us digest our food. Uh, life as we know it, wouldn't be possible without bacteria. For two billion years of the four billion year history of life on this planet, all the life was single cell. You go back in time two billion years, you would see nothing but single cell organisms all over the place, most of it looking like this bacteria here. Archaea bacteria, really, really, really cool. Has a reputation for being extremophiles, in other words, living in extreme environments. The thing is, they can live in any environment. But they get this reputation because they found some archaea, archaea bacteria that can live, for example, in 113 degrees Celsius water. Now remember, water boils at 100 Celsius. You've got 113 degrees Celsius water, and the archaea bacteria are like, well, thank you very much. This is like a big hot tub for us. We like it. Fortunately for us, this particular bacteria does not seem to cause illness in humans. At least none have been found yet that seem to cause illness in humans, but they live in some really wild extreme environments, in addition to all the same places that you bacteria can live. But they can, for example, survive in salty lakes, uh, lakes that are so salty that you bacteria can't handle that. They, however, can. It has to do with their, their, uh, their, their lipid membrane, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, drew a picture, as a matter of fact, of a bacteria over here, a very bad quick circle, but it gets one point across in a bacteria, both types of bacteria, the DNA basically hangs out. It hangs out in these structures called capsids, but there is no nucleus. They're called prokaryotic, which literally means before the nucleus. And they have generally, though not always, this little lipid bilayer. They're basically like a little fat bubble. 
And remember, and this will come in important, this will be important later, things go in and out of the cell through the lipid bilayer. Things have to get into the cell, things have to get out of the cell. That's gonna be important for the second part of the notes today. So a quick recap is we went through some current events. We did the first two kingdoms that we're gonna talk about of the six kingdoms, which is bacteria, recently divided into two kingdoms. You've got eubacteria and archaeobacteria. And for the next side, which I'll slide over here in just a second, we're gonna talk about a math tie-in and how this math tie-in relates to putting a limit on the size of cells. Remember, if you want to really understand the science, you've got to do the math. Math and science go hand in hand. And then the one extra little part, which is how does this math relate to the size of cells? Okay, if you look at the key terms, I'm just gonna leave those up here. You can write those down, pause the video if you need to, but of course they were also on our notes at pacificascience.org, they're in your Google Classroom. Those 10 key terms will carry us through the next uh, week. So these are week eight and nine key terms. We're finishing up, of course, week eight right now. Check out that most of these here are right out of the textbook. Uh, these last couple are not. In other words, the plasmids, for example, are not in the textbook, but I think it's important that we mention plasmids because they have to do specifically with bacteria cells. Okay, here's that math tie-in I would like you to do. The students, of course, had this in class today. Your job is to take a cube. And if you look at a cube like this right here, here's this particular cube, I'll hold up the screen, is one centimeter cubed, um, one centimeter on each side. The student's job was to finish off this chart. It turns out if you have the side length going from one to 10, you've got the volume being length times width times height. Well, of course, with the cube, that's super easy. The length, the width, and the height are all the same thing. So for example, if the centimeter if your side is one centimeter long, it's just one times one times one, and the volume is one centimeter, right? However, one centimeter cubed, I should say. However, when you look at the surface area, that's a little bit different. This is a two-dimensional measurement. It's gonna be in centimeters squared. And remember, it's like if you're taking a cube and painting every side of it, how much paint will you have to cover? What is your surface area? Well, the formula for that would be six times length times width, and of course, in a cube, the length and the width, and of course the height, but the length and the width are the same number. So in this time, it would be six times one, which is six centimeters squared. As you fill out this chart, you're gonna see these two uh, columns right here, the volume and the surface area grow with different rates. And how does this relate to cells? This was the part where I wanted you to watch today's video partly as a recap of what we did in class, and partly as the tie-in, the math tie-in with the cells and this. You might remember that we talked about cells as being little factories. If we're gonna use that factory analogy that books do all the time, let's go with it then. If we think of cells as factories, you think of materials coming into a factory and then leaving the material, you, uh, leaving the, the factory as products. So you've got resources coming in, whatever it is that you happen to be making, think, say you're making shoes, you've got you know, the leather and the rubber and the laces and the fabric all coming in, and then the finished product is going out along with waste products and things like that. And if you use this factory analogy, which is a pretty good analogy, material has to tra travel in and out of a factory and communication has to happen within the factory. In other words, if you think of the nucleus of the cell or the DNA as controlling all the activities of that cell as controlling the factory, it has to communicate with every part of the interior of that factory. Well, if we take that analogy just a little step further, let's look at what happens when we chart those numbers that we just figured out. As the volume, the amount of space in the factory goes up, it goes up steeper and steeper and steeper. I used to have students uh, graph this themselves, but with distance learning, I'm trying to kind of show you the general trend here. The surface area, the amount of area of the lipid bilayer, in other words, the doors to the factory, where the place where things can go in and out of that factory, it rises, of course, too, as you increase the size, but it does not rise as quickly. In other words, when an organism has to get bigger, why doesn't it just make the cells bigger? Why don't the cells just grow? I mean, that's what they do after all anyway, isn't it? The reason is, there's a math limit on the size of your cell. The volume starts going up so much that the surface area, the doors to the factory, if you will, can't keep up. You can't get material in and out of the cell fast enough to keep up with the growth. 
you can't get the communication from the DNA, the, the main office, if you will, of the factory. You can't get the communication out to the rest of the cell fast enough uh, because the volume, the amount of space inside starts to go up too quickly. So a very good example, a good crossover with our math classes and a good example of how math puts a limit on things. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the animal kingdom. For example, uh, animals, as they get larger, you have a limit on their size in terms of what their legs can support. Very, very similar to this graph right here. So, hope that was a good recap of what we did in class today. We'll pick this up next week as we go in detail through each of the six kingdoms of life. Have a great weekend, everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.